Ahem. Welcome back to the Agassino Zingo Show, episode number 159. That's Uno Cinco Nueve. Welcome. Bienvenidos. How you doing? Happy New Week. Happy New Monday. Monday motivation. All that malarkey. What's up? What's going on? It's me, your host, Agostino Zingo. Feeling good, man. I've got my coffee in hand. I'm kind of feeling like I've got the coffee shits in the morning, but... I really should go for a shit right now, but you know I'm gonna hang it, hang on in there, and hold it in until the end of the podcast, and do it then. But yeah, happy Monday, man. Um, the sun didn't last too long, did it? Looking at my window now, and um, it's wet, it's cold, it's uh really foggy, and it's probably one of those days where if you were uh, if you're if you're the kind of person that hates days, right? You know that I always mention it all the time, but you know the kind of person that looks forward to Fridays and Saturdays and all that sort of shit. You're going to hate today because today is like your quintessential uh, grey, wet, miserable Monday. And for sure, you know, like uh, this great country we live in, which is called the UK, we have this weird issue where whenever it rains or whenever the natural elements tend to take a bit of a turn, all our public transport systems grind to a halt or are incredibly slow. So coupled with the, the fact that some of you guys out there are depressed because it's a certain day, you're depressed because you have to go back to work. You're depressed because, you know, in general, you're just depressed. And then add to the fact that the weather's fucking shit. And it probably took you, I don't know, 10 to 20 minutes longer to get to work this morning. Because, you know, generally it's fucking horrible. Um, I have sympathy for you in that regard. I have much sympathy for you. Um, But, you know, it is what it is, right? Today I'm going to probably take the bus. Um, I'm probably going to take a bit longer to get to work because I generally like to... I don't know, when it's wet, I'll try to take the bus because, you know, it's just nicer to kind of look outside and shit. And as well, because it's a longer journey, I can just read a book and just kind of unwind and not get too caught up with the stuff that's going on outside. But I understand, man. I get it. It can be a little bit bummed out. It can be a little bit of an of annoying time. But hey, you know what the silver lining is? It's the, we're coming up to the end of February now, right? Um, last week's of February. And then we head into March. And then from that time onwards, it's going to get a little bit more lighter. It's going to get a little bit more warmer. We're going to head into spring. And then festival season starts. So, you know, you don't have long until you can start going for, you know, after work drinks from like Wednesday onwards. If you're, even if you're not doing that now. You know, all the beer guns are going to be full. It's only around the corner. So just hang on in there. Hang on in there, you miserable cunts. It's not going to be that bad, all right? Relax. Take it easy. Um, apart from that, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling great. Had a pretty quiet weekend. For those of you that are wondering, I didn't do that much. Um, usually, for the most part, it looks like, having looked at my weekend, having looked at what I do, it's a weird kind of position to be in, right? It's like um, when I started DJing, I started doing it quite a lot or you know getting booked more often than i was in the past and it you know started to become a little bit more serious um it seems like oh let, let's say no let's say before i started to get booked more regularly i would go out a lot more than i do now and i thought at the time when i'd get start getting booked more regularly it allowed me to go out more often right because i'm out but usually most of the time especially if i'm playing in like stratford um there isn't the i don't have the desire to go out again because it will require me to like get an uber to do whatever because you know it's just it's too far whatever and i want to get there quickly to kind of you know get as much time as i can out of the nights because most places are going to close at free especially my favorite places like mixed garage and stuff that closes at free if i want to stay out longer and go to like fold that's in canning town that's requiring an uber or requiring a train journey just a bit long right but I always thought, oh yeah, when I DJ out more often, I'm going to go out more, more often. But it's interesting to see that when I'm DJing, I don't go out more often. And when I'm not DJing, I just stay in. Because it's the rare occasion I have to just stay inside at home when I'm on the weekends. Right? I, don't have, I don't have an obligation to go outside. And it's, um, it's weird, isn't it? It's weird and strange because I think there is a part of me that really thinks that I should be trying to go out more and just listen to music because the times that I have been out when I went to Mixed Garage to go see Dr. Rubenstein and Roy Perez play back to back it was a real eye opener in regard of like just seeing really high level DJs playing in that kind of venue for four hours straight that was a real pleasure to me right and it gave me loads of inspiration it kind of really motivated me to go back home and dig through tunes and kind of you know uh, and just you know just try and get better at what I do and that's kind of the hope that you have, right? But sometimes you can get lazy because you have stuff like Boiler Room online. You have loads of fucking random videos people upload. You have um, you, lo you have loads of great meme pages and, and kind of underground or electronic 
uh, music pages that kind of collate images and people playing all around the world. So you feel like you're going out because you have so much inf- you have so much of this visual stimuli. You have so many of these video clips that are showing you people in festivals, DJing, wherever they may be, uh, track ID things. There's loads of stuff going on around you on the social media space that it kind of feels like you've already been going out. And plus, on top of that, I DJ most weekends, so... I feel like I'm always out when I'm not really out. If I look at it on the kind of, you know, general scoop of things. And I think beforehand when I wasn't DJing, I'd be going to all the big ticket events. Every event the person was playing, whether it was this player, person playing at Printworks or this person playing at Ministry of Sound or they were playing at Oval Factory or they were playing at the Pickle Factory or they were playing at E1. I'd go to fucking everything. And now I don't go to nothing because I play out most of the time and, you know, I don't really have the owners to go out because I don't want to waste money or I don't want to, I don't know, stay out any longer because I'm tired, right? Um, so I think I need to make a bit of a change in that regard. I need to kind of flip the switch and go out more often, or go out to see DJs that I like to go see perform, just to go see them perform. Because nowadays too, I don't really go, I don't really go to gigs as much to like musical gigs, indie bands. Because for the most part, I do all my gigging, um, I get all my gigging quota out of the way by going to festivals. Right, festivals for me have become like a real good cheat code to tap into loads of music you haven't listened to and to also see the, your favourite bands like Primavera Festival being a good example of it right I get to see the likes of Asa Brocky and Skepta and loads of other bands I didn't know existed right um, you get to see people like Arctic Monkeys right play in front of you for like a set of like an hour and a half which you know go and see um, Arctic Monkeys play in the O2 will cost at least 100 quid so you get to see all these people for like two, under 200 pounds in a great um, you know location such as Barcelona nice, nice weather great food great ambience blah 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 so i get all my gigging kind of indie sort of stuff like hip-hop malarkey out of the way by just seeing people at festivals outside of the, of the big people like the travis scotts the drake some of those kind of guys who you might just go and see them on tour um play their own show but for the most part i try and get all my kind of gigging stuff out of the way through festivals so i think there is some space there left to go and see djs play in clubs and because now i'm djing more often I have the experience of going out more often sober. So I don't really have that kind of barrier because I think for some people, that's the barrier they always have, right? Where I know some people immediately when they say, when when you suggest, oh, let's go out and see his DJ play, for them in their head, they've immediately got this fucking warning light in their head. That, oh shit, it's going to involve drugs. It's going to involve drinking. It's going to involve getting fucked and hammered, right? Because usually for the most part, unfortunately for us UK people, um, maybe because we're inherently a boozy nation i don't know what it is but we do kind of associate going out to a nightclub to get hammered and fucked up especially electronic music wise i don't know why that is but it is what it is so it's hard to kind of make that switch and be like no you just go out to go see a dj that you like to go go like that you like just to go see them play live for instance um and i'm gonna try and do that more often now going forward i think that's my mo so um yeah try and do it because again because they're quite they're usually quite cheap they're usually in interesting spaces um and yeah, it's just a good, it's good value for money for the most part, right? If you go see a really big DJ play, like Nina Kravitz or whatever, she's going to play for more than an hour. It's going to be like 20 quid. Um, you're going to go see other DJs play too who you didn't know existed and they're going to really impress you and then you're going to start following them on social. It's just, you know, it's always, it's always a good thing. But yeah, um, weekend pretty quiet, chilled out. Um, last, the fucking, the biggest thing actually of the weekend was watching the UFC. Uh, UFC Fight Night and Ghana versus... Um. Oh Jesus Christ! Why does my mind go completely blank? <sighs> oh Jesus! What? Who, who, who ain't gonna fight the over there? My mind's going completely blank. I think I need to go to the toilet so bad. I had a bit of a brain fart. Who did fight? Who? Who? Who did um Francis and Ghana fight? What's wrong with me? Uh, Francis and Ghana. Oh, who did he fight? Who did he fight? Oh, that's it. Cain Velasquez. Fucking hell. There we go. I've got it. So, anyway, um, probably because it went so fast, it was um, the fight finished on the 30 seconds. And you have to kind of feel for Cain Velasquez, right? He's always been kind of touted. I've only started watching the UFC in like the last couple of years. But before that, I'd always hear people say Cain Velasquez was like, um, you know, maybe, you know, pound for pound the best heavyweight of all time, right? Because he's just big, massive... Um, heavyweight who can move like a middleweight right he kind of moves really quickly he's got insane wrestling great stand-up just um really really great endurance you know like you can just put the pressure on you all the way through three rounds five rounds doesn't really matter um but his injuries his bodies are just taken too much of too much damage right and he seems like and i think he was out for maybe a year and a half this time um and this is i think because of uh a back injury, I think, or something along those kind of lines, right? He's really been suffering. He's really been going... It's really been something that he hasn't really been able to kind of um, shake 
and you're seeing a lot of wear and tear on his body. And for the most part, fighters are similar to like football players where, you know, the the younger they were kind of like coming into the pro circuit or just, you know, fighting at the amateur level, um, the older their body is, even though they might be young in age. So Cain Velasquez is only like 30, I think 38, 39. But fight wise, the gap in his fighting has been quite insane over the last couple of years, right? I think if I'm looking at his kind of like um, fight record that he's had over the last few years. So, for instance, like he's had in between, so he lost to Junior, or well, he won to against uh, JDS, right? Um, in 2013. And his next fight after that against uh, Fabrizio Verdum was 2015. So, a two year break in between that. I'm assuming that's to do with an injury. Then, after that loss, he came back and beat Travis Brown. And that was, again, another year gap in between that, right? A year and one month. And then, and then now facing uh, Francis Ngannou, he'd been out for two and a half years. In 2016, it looks like around 2019. So the timeout, the injuries, because I think already you hear a lot of people say with the timeout with some fighters, it's already a problem because, you know, you come back, quote unquote, rusty. But on top of the rust, um, coming back from injuries, just like, you know, especially at this higher level of fighting, it's just too hard to probably do. And Francis Ngannou has been somebody who has kind of fallen a bit of hard times, isn't it? He kind of got thrown into the lines then. He kind of had a little, a, a couple of blips on his record. And it kind of seemed like his confidence or, you know, the aura that he had around him was crumbling. But I just think it was just the naivety of coming into a sport. He kind of came into it relying immensely on his knockout power. Then when you suddenly fight people who can kind of like, you know, stifle people like uh, Derek Lewis or Stephen Muir, people that can kind of like stuff his um power and kind of take the fight down to wrestling he kind of struggled a little bit and you know and dana for the most part was a bit of a dickhead to him too you know they kind of hyped him up as this big african beast and he was punching what did he do when he kicked something and he was got this massive number he was training at the ufc performance institute it seemed like the ufc were really pumping money into this guy because they saw him as like you know the guy that was going to take out the entire heavyweight division and become like the reigning champ but you know ufc gods don't give a shit so they threw him. They they threw him Stipe Miocic. They threw him Derek Lewis, and he lost resoundingly to those two people, right? And he didn't look like himself. But then the the, the following fights, you know, against Curtis Blade was probably the best thing for him. And then facing Cain Velasquez, people who like someone who everyone rates as one of the high, one of the kind of best of all time, he comes out and he and he kind of knocks him out in thirty seconds. You're like, wow. So I'm just happy to see him come back, you know, from the dead effectively. Um, and again, you just got feel for Cain Velasquez, man. He's going through that training camp, getting back fit. Uh, recovering from his injuries and then effectively getting taken out in 30 seconds. I think when he watched the fight live, it looked like he only lost because he buckled his knee and he kind of like, it looks like he made a tall ligament. But when you watch it closely, you get you get to see that Francis Ngannou actually did connect, I think with an uppercut, um, which kind of sent, uh, which kind of sent um, Cain Velasquez backwards, which then kind of caused him to kind of buck on under his knee. So effectively, he kind of did get, you know, stomped and knocked out because of that power. And just, you know, you just can't, there's nothing you can train for. Because I guess if you're Cain Velasquez and you're a wrestler and you want to take him down, you have to get near him. But getting near him, you're just at risk of receiving one of those fucking bombs from Senegal. Um, or is it from Cameroon, right? Cameroon? Cameroon or second, what is it from? Cameroon, yeah. But bombs from Cameroon. But yeah, happy for Francis and Ghana. Great to see. The rest of the fights, I didn't really um, get a chance to watch because I ended up falling asleep and only waking up to see the main fight. But again, 30 seconds to Cain Velasquez. You've got to feel for the guy. But, you know, I guess that is the fight game. Anyways, um, going on into it, what else have we got? Let's get into some topics because, you know, it's better to just dive on in, dive on deep. So, number one topic, um, London Fashion Week has kicked off. Everyone, everyone in the fashion, Shane is descending on Somerset House and Truman Brewery and all those other places to go and see loads of different fashion collections be paraded across this week that we call Fashion Week. For the most part, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big, uh, fan of women's fashion week I, that's kind of how i kind of fell in love with the whole fashion scene or industry um from the outside looking in i kind of got into it by reading uh the style magazine that was included in the sunday times i used to kind of read the sunday times religiously like every sunday for the most part and it came with this little um insert magazine which is called style mag that was an amazing magazine i thought for me personally because it was my introduction to fashion because what it did really well which is what kind of goes back to this topic that i want to talk about is it appeal to the, you know, the intellectual fashionistas, right? The people that are in the scene heavy and kind of gave us fuck about who the fashion director was of a particular brand or who was involved in this and behind the scenes personalities. And it also did a good way of kind of bridging the gap in terms of the commercial aspect of it, right? Highlighting people within the 
kind of you know terrestrial tv world who are bringing fashion forward or presenters or designers whatever it may be so i, I like the kind of i liked how it kind of like was able to join those two worlds right the overground and the underground and um for me like one of my biggest kind of fashion influences or person that I kind of got into or someone that I kind of really admired and it kind of actually made me want to go to Central Martins was uh Matthew Williamson that's what that's the kind of era that I kind of came into fashion with right those kind of long floral uh sweeping dresses that he used to make right loads of color and he was somebody that kind of really influenced me and really kind of got me into the whole fashion idea you know this guy you know was kind of designing really feminine really sensitive delicate dresses um and it just kind of really blew my mind how a guy could be able to kind of tap into and somehow be able to have a voice when it came to making those kind of outfits and then you kind of get into it and you kind of go deep dive you find out you went to central martins you find out who else went central martins you go through the alexander mcqueen route and then all of a sudden boom you get into com and then whoof you know, you're there, you're involved in fashion. And um, talking about that even more, I was kind of looking at the collections, you know, going down the runway. And for the most part, you know, there's been loads of great collections that I can talk about. But two that really stuck out for me, I really kind of drummed her my kind of um, how I look at fashion and how it kind of talks to or appeals to different aspects of my life and how it informs the things that I do is uh, Victoria Beckham and Grace Wells Bonner, right? Now, both of these, there's nothing that you can kind of say that kind of ties them together apart from the fact that they're female, right? The fact that they're women in fashion. Uh, for the most part, uh, Grace Wells Bonner came into fashion from um, the uh, menswear angle, just trying to do a, couple, a few women's, women's wear pieces now, which is kind of quote unquote her debut. Uh, but, you know, Victoria Beckham occupies a particular kind of niche and Grace Wells, uh, Grace Wells Bonner requires, occupies a different kind of niche. But what I like about it is that in Grace Wells, on Wells Bonner's end of it, she's like, you know, uh, an unabashed intellectual, right? A bookworm, somebody that really takes pleasure in really diving on deep into the themes and the ideas behind her collection. Somebody that's able to kind of reference really abstract things, but then kind of bring it back into this one um, unifying narrative. Somebody that's very um, able, just very... Um, you can tell what she's trying to do, right? She's trying to redefine this idea of black masculinity right the idea of what it means to be a man within black culture what it represents um trying to kind of bring it back to this kind of bit more of a sensitive a bit more of a wafy a bit more of a culturally aware idea of uh black identity and in general just kind of you know give it a little bit of an intellectual tint right not have it be maybe too street music kind of like surface layer based and a little bit more layered a little bit more culturally aware a little bit more intellectual for, for lack of a better term and then on the victoria beckham end of things you've got a woman who's kind of came into fashion you know you couldn't get more glitzy you couldn't get more glamorous you couldn't get more pop you couldn't get more uh general public right you couldn't get more let's say for lack of a better term vanilla than victoria beckham right but through a period of time through just hard work through very through like a you know a very kind of you know tumultuous journey through fashion where she was kind of the you know ostracized no one really wanted to be associated with her no one really wanted to review her shows people didn't really want to attend her shows people didn't really want to admit that they liked what she did um people didn't want to make sure she had she was validated um there was a real tension with, with it with her trying to fit in and it seems like in the last few years she's finally accepted herself finally kind of come to grips of how what role she plays in and she's finally been able to kind of you know display her idea of femininity right and i think this latest connection has been probably one of the best ones so far i mean the idea of like you know um offering uh, an entire wardrobe for the modern woman right being able to take her from dropping off the kids in the morning to going into the office to popping out for a boozy lunch to going out for a dance uh to maybe going to a meeting to picking up your husband or partner whatever it may be like she's been able to provide an entire wardrobe for a woman who kind of wants to have it all and victoria beckham is you know the quintessential have it all person but there is something that ties them together and i thought this the idea of um it's the idea of uh kind of because I've, I've heard wells bonner talk about it where you know she's kind of come from being like a a young woman who's also a mixed race and having to kind of justify her blackness right because she's fairly uh let's say uh, fair skinned right she kind of leans more towards the kind of white side of it looking wise right she's not she's just, apart from the hair made she come across very light looking right so i can imagine in her growing up in south london the idea of like you know wanting to prove that you're black wanting to kind of justify your blackness is a very hard thing right because you you know you've got your parents right you've got two parents one's black one's white you identify with both sides of it but 
you know, and yeah, from the outside or from the general public, for the most part, mixed race people are generally kind of just looked at as black, right? They're not necessarily looked at as as white, even, right? It's just they just kind of relegate you over there, and unless you kind of position yourself somewhere else. So it's that idea behind having to kind of juggle these two worlds, and then kind of do them justice by putting, you know, by what you send down the runway without kind of it coming across a little bit pastiche. And she's done a great job of doing that. And so is Victoria Beckham, right? She's she's somehow. Like, no one really talks about the fact that Victoria Beckham has more resources than anyone, probably, on the fashion, um, you know, scene or calendar, apart from maybe a Gabriela Hurst or, like, a Simona Rocha or something, right? She has more resources than anyone to kind of really go for it and really do great work, right? Because, you know, effectively, her husband's David Beckham, right? They have all the money, all the resources to do a great job in fashion, but she's somehow been able to come at it and still be quite personable, and still be quite, and it feel real, right, and it not feel fake, it not feel manufactured, it doesn't feel like it got rushed, because I'm sure, if you're if you're Victoria Beckham, you could easily go out there, and just hire a bunch of kids, right, um, to just design your, your clothes, you free to stand in front of it, pretend you designed something, and for it to look like everything that's on the runway, and for it to just look amazing, and just really polished, and just everything correct, and nothing, everything perfect, just no duds in it, you could easily do that. But I think like, I think in my opinion, what she done is that she purposely went into it and tried to make fashion and tried to design clothes. In the beginning, it didn't resonate. It didn't connect. It wasn't good. And it got better over time. And I think that has been able, she's, because of that journey, she's been able to kind of do away with any sort of criticism that says, oh, you just, you know, you came into it being a sort of rich person, right? You came into it as, you know, one fifth of one of the, you know, biggest pop groups in the world, right? In the Spice Girls. And you're married to one of the biggest football stars in the world in David Beckham. You have more resources than anyone out there. But through the journey of like, you know, making shitty clothes in the beginning and then, and then progressively getting better and better and better, um, I think she's been able to kind of, you know, circumnavigate it. And now she's probably one of the leading voices within fashion or especially within that kind of, you know, uh area of fashion where you're a you know you're a w- modern day woman who kind of wants to look great but don't you don't want to look too fuddy daddy you don't want to look too you know avant-garde you just want to look stunning in the morning you want to look as you've made an effort but you also want to be super comfortable and i think um victoria beckham's been able to um marry that with you know of course great fashion and on grace Wells bonner side of it she'll be able to marry the intellectual side of it which can get a little bit lofty it can maybe go a little bit over your head but the clothes are just good the clothes just look amazing the clothes look like they fit like a glove like they look um, some of the trousers for men uh, the tailoring on them just looks fantastic and you know it's not something that kind of guys look at but they make your bum look great right and that's where we have a great sign for great trousers for guys like it, it makes your bum look super taut right um you stand up really well when some of the jackets looks like or some of the the jumpers and shirts she makes it makes you want to pull your shoulders back and really look up like there's something there's just little things about it that i kind of love and i think those two collections for me so far have been things that i've kind of looked at and been oh my god that's amazing if, if if ever there was a wardrobe i'd kind of want you know for a partner would be probably victoria beckham and for just for me would be definitely um what the stuff that grace Wells bond is doing i'm going to quickly scra- scroll through some of the stuff that i've seen here from both and then we can carry on but yeah um those two collections for me were some of the outstanding pieces that i saw and again um, i'm just happy for victoria beckham for the most part because i remember how again having read those magazines Star Magazine and a few others. I remember what it what it was like for her in the beginning, right? How people were talking about her, how people were talking about the the woman that she was catering to, and now it seems like maybe she's kind of um, benefited from the fact that you know uh, fast fashion like Zara and H and M have kind of proliferated into the fashion sphere, and for the most part, women in that area don't mind you know tapping into those kind of places to buy certain sort of staple pieces for their wardrobe. People like Cos. Uniqlo weekday have kind of done a good job about it even Bershka for the for the most part in recent years and maybe the kind of you know the rising of aware the awareness in the general public of what fashion is has probably maybe helped her more because those women are now you know a good entry point to fashion might be going into it with um looking at stuff like uh Victoria Beckham does and maybe going to Bottega Veneta or to going to Margaret Howe maybe that's a little bit too um it's a little bit too fashiony, but in terms of just like an, an entryway, Victoria Beckham is probably one of the best at doing it. And again, um, if there's somebody out there who's really vying to swoop up or to vacuum up the old Celine client, I think Victoria Beckham's probably another one who's 
definitely occupying that space really well. And I think if you're a woman out there who was a big fan of what Phoebe Fowler was doing at Celine, I think you would be hard pressed to not to take a look at what Victoria Beckham is doing. And I'm going to get some of the stuff up there now. Um, and yeah, in general, just like great looks overall. Everything looks comfortable. Everything looks sleek. Everything looks sexy. Everything looks extremely wearable. And um, yeah, I love it all. And even these shoes that I'm not really a big fan of, right? These are uh, peep toe shoes that I've that were really popular. I think a couple of years ago, you saw them everywhere wearing like in terms of you saw them in terms of mules. Now, a lot of the mules that girls are wearing are not peep toe. Um, but I, there's been a lot of this. I've seen, I think in the resort collection I showed a couple of weeks, a couple of episodes ago, kind of showed it. And I like that she's been kind of like carrying that through. Um, and again, just stuff that I will generally not like to see effectively she's been able to make really sexy and really sleek and i'm sure women appreciate that as well for the most part um yeah just great tailoring great great look stuff that can easily be interchanged and kind of you know popped into different kind of outfits and just stunning as well and the styling as well is always really cool i'm not sure who styles the shows but the styling as well is also really really well really well done i'm a big fan of everything that victoria beckham does for the most part um yeah me like it me like it me like it I'm not sure if the diffusion line is still running. I'm sure she had a diffusion line, right? Victoria for Victoria or something like that. Um, but yeah, I love the styling. Love the looks. And again, if I was a young lady uh, making it in the industry, I think this is definitely the kind of stuff that I'd want to wear. Um, going to interviews, going to work. And I'd even even these little midriff pieces as well, they're really interesting, right? The way it hugs the figure and really makes a great silhouette. And again, it could probably work really well depending on, regardless of, of kind of the, you know, overall shape of the lady. I think as well, very, very flattering. Again, really, really great pieces. And just stuff that kind of looks like what something that like Victoria Beckham would wear, right? These trousers are, this outfit, essentially, look number 32 is essentially like, you know, a quintessential outfit you'd see Victoria Beckham wear. Like, it really kind of accentuates her legs, great jump on top to kind of, you know, longer sleeves popping out. The bag looks really cool. It's another thing she does really well accessories i'm not sure the bag designer is for victoria beckham but they do a good job as well in that regard um again styling the color palette says that that's a really again i mentioned, I mentioned it a couple of times i think if you ever want to get some hacks or get some tips into how to put outfits together in terms of especially color based because i think sometimes in wardrobes i know for me i usually go for the same sort of looks all the time because i know what works inside my wardrobe but sometimes you can mix things up by going by color by instead of going by what the thing is instead of going, go, oh this is a bomber jacket usually goes with this no go by what the color is and sometimes to cheat just check some check some runway shows and look at the color palettes they use you can easily get some tips on it and this is quite a good idea right you've got like a dusty um or like a light lilac top uh, jumper with a red skirt and red shoes right and it's something that you wouldn't necessarily put together in your outfit now not not, not everyone has these kind of bright colors in their wardrobe for the most part people just generally tend to go for quite subdued colors but if you did have a red skirt or a pair of red jeans or a pair of red trousers or like a lilac blue top or you know something of those kind of lines this is a good outfit to put together even if it was in jeans a pair of shorts it would look quite cool like i can imagine that kind of palette looking really well looking really good and with a pair of like vintage patagonia shorts uh a kind of you know um a random Hanes t-shirt that's kind of similar sort of color maybe deep purple with some sandals that would look really cool for the summer so again great look great outfits great color palettes from victoria beckham um that's one that's last look there blah, blah, blah. again it's just and you, you can just tell isn't it that's like a um i think she mentioned in the show notes that it was like an a to z collection and you can actually tell like from the from the last look which is you know kind of like evening wear going out for dinner right um, with the fella with the partner and then from the from the beginning you can tell that's like the business like getting shit done dropping the kids off um you know going to meetings whatever it may be um again so a great collection overall well done to victoria agostina approves i'm sure she's happy about that <laughs> um and then next on the list um we have grace wells bonner of course, I'm a big fan of. I think she has an exhibition now at the moment going on at the Serpentine Gallery, I'm pretty sure. So check that out if you're in and around the area. I'm pretty sure it's a free exhibition, but it's going to finish soon, I think March 19th. So don't sleep. And again, um, a great collection that kind of nod, gives nods to loads of very influential black intellectuals that I'm a big fan of. One of them being Ishmael Reed, which is kind of, you know, a, a screw on the top of this tunic. I'm, like, I love this tunic top. Again, just a, you know, you can read a lot into a clothes and probably reading too much into it but you know this kind of african inspired tunic that also has um 
African American, you know, clothes tied into it with the fact that it's a kind of like a baseball shirt. It's just a clever. It's clever, but also just looks great, right? There's no need to kind of. You don't need to know the backstory of it. You don't need to know who Ishmael Reed is, but just the fact that it looks like a baseball top that looks. It, it looks like a cross between a tun, an African tunic and a baseball top is just fun, kind of perfect for me. And then, the, and then I also love the fact that she always does really good African shoes. Like African African uncle inspired shoes. I think if you just type in Grace Wells Bonner onto Google Images, you'll see some of the shoes that she makes. It's just like ridiculous looking shoes that remind me a lot of like the uncles that used to come into barbershops when I used to be younger and I was only allowed to go to the barbershop my dad went to. Now I go to my own one, you know, but back in the day when you're younger and your dad takes you to those African barbershops that, you know, it takes you fucking four hours to get a haircut and the haircut's fucking terrible. But it's always good joke, it's always good banter. And you always have these guys coming in who look like, you know, they're going out to party, but they're just gonna hang around with their friends in a barbershop and talk shit but yeah um overall again i just love her idea of the modern man the modern black man essentially um it's just really nicely done um there's loads of really nice pieces in there that you know of course apply to those different wardrobes and just great looks overall great tailoring pieces and just you know I, i'm a real big fan of it of course there's a inclusion of loads of women's looks which are kind of the main reason why she showed to kind of debut that collection but the men's stuff is just so great man i'm a real big fan of the stuff that she she, she does uh grace was one of my favorites of the of the fashion calendar outside of like the jw edison's all those kind of likes and maybe it, for me like an extension of what jw edison does right but again maybe with a uh, with a uh, the perspective being more so you know the black intellectual class and nowadays especially with you know what's happening in london nowadays i think it's even more important to have a voice within london you know being able to speak um or being able to present a different version a different vision of what it means to be um a kid living in the inner city a black kid living in the city you've got someone like a cold war doing the same thing right representing one image and you got this too so i'm a big fan of it overall um just beautiful like this hat this look here look number 23 it's just incredible isn't it the hat the big shoot jacket the trousers the shoes it's just all really perfect i'm a big fan of what she does so big up grace was um for doing that Anyway, moving on, moving on, on in. Let's get away from the fashion talk. There's a lot of stuff on. I think JW Anderson is showing as well. There's other people. Loads of events happening as well, tying into it. I saw a big uh, faces, places plus places plus faces event happening that that happened last Friday. That looked really good too. So I think everyone's enjoying. Everyone's eating really well from the fruit of fashion. So big up everyone out there but anyway let's move on to some other topics that are of 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 interest let's get this screen here low bada bing bada boom so what else do we have here so yeah let's talk should I put it here let me put it here leave it there okay so what have you got here on this so Sha Shamimia Begum, bride to be, wants to come back. So this is interesting stories, right? So this um this is something I've only caught wind of the last couple of days, but this um ISIS, this former ISIS bride, right? Let's read the whole story and kind of get the grips of it. But it's an interesting story just because of you know, um, will it tie? It kind of it kind of ties in a little bit to cancel culture, and it kind of ties in a little bit to like you know. Uh, public shaming and forgiveness and the Liam Nielsen thing that happened recently, that happened a few weeks ago with him saying he wanted to, you know, after someone in his family got raped, he wanted to go out and beat up all black people, um, which was, you know, verging on racism, if not, you know, the, the antithesis of racism. But we're reaching, I think, like, we're reaching a point where we're having to try to really come to grips with the idea of forgiveness, with the idea of, like, taking a, a PewDiePie term, an oopsie, right we're living in an era now where you can't make a mistake you can't make an oops you can't fuck up you can't fumble right a fumble is is is, is um is paramount to a cancelling is paramount to you kind of going out there on a big apology tour and it's paramount to you maybe losing everything that you've kind of worked hard for right but we're suddenly reaching a point now where people are starting to realize that those reactions are coming are becoming a little bit ridiculous and there may be um that we're not actually teaching people to be better people we're just shaming them um, into irrelevancy, into hiding, whatever it may be, and then that's building up resentment for whatever it is that happened that led to it, right? And this situation now with this um, Shamima Begum is uh, probably a different example, maybe a more extreme example, but an, ex an example nonetheless, because, you know, you because 
At the end of the day, you can only go by what someone tells you. You can only go by the strength of someone's word. You can't necessarily read too much into anything. You can only go by what you see and what you hear, right? And you have to make a kind of um, a, 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 an informed decision based on that. It's hard to do, but that's all we can do. So essentially, uh, this story goes as follows. Uh, the teen... Um, so uh, uh, Isis Bride, Shamima Begum, this is on Sky Sports News, has told Sky News... Gets up here on screen. Da, 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 there it is, Shamima Begum. Um, Isis Bride, Shamima Begum has told Sky News a lot of people should have sympathy for her as she spoke out for a wish to return to UK. The 19 year old who has just given birth to a baby boy in Syrian refugee camp also said that the UK authorities have had no evidence of her doing anything dangerous in response. In an interview with Sky John Sparks, she claimed that she has uh, just a housewife during her four years in terrorist uh, caliphate in Syria, where she married a young Dutch ISIS fighter called Yego Rigic three weeks after she arrived in the country in 2015. While she was aware of the beheadings and executions being carried out by extremists, she said she was okay with it because she had heard Islamically that it was allowed. So this girl was 15, right? And she was whisked away to Syria um, to become a bride-to-be for an ISIS fighter, right? This Dutch guy, as, as the statement says. And it really kind of, is really kind of coming to grips with it. I've seen people on social media have a really split opinion on what the deal is. And she's like, now, you know, her life is in danger. She wants to protect her child, have her child grow up in like a safe environment. And she wants to, you know, have guarantees when she comes back to the UK that she's not going to be persecuted. But of course, you know, the UK government can't do that, right? Because effectively she was living with, you know, living with terrorists that she was aware of for the best part of what four years right so they're obviously going to want to question her and find out what exactly was going on and gain some kind of intelligence and maybe through that investigation it might transpire that she was actually more active in her role there than she's kind of letting on but this vid this interview with her on 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 twitter that i saw was very interesting very illuminating and kind of had made me have sympathy for her but also made me understand why some people are are kind of cautious about um inviting her back into the country and i want to just kind of play it for you guys here Let's get a pin on the screen um and it really again I'm, I'm not really i'm not really sure what position i have on it in general but it's an interesting conversation to have especially with the council culture we have going on at the moment where if someone makes one mistake we can't just go yeah, back yeah. we can't just we we can't take their word for it that they've kind of made amends we kind of have to i don't know what it is do we have a process uh to come to get reintegrated back into society right someone goes away gets ostracized makes a mistake how do we reintegrate get them back into to society do we banish her forever? Are there some things that are unforgivable? What is it? I don't know. But let's let's play this interview and see what she has to say. Da, 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 da. Here we go. A lot of people should have like sympathy towards me for everything I've been through. You know, when I, when I, I, I didn't know what I was getting into when I left, and I just was hoping that maybe me, for the sake of me and my child, they, they let me come back. The head of the foreign intelligence services in the UK says people like you are potentially very dangerous what would you say to him they don't have any evidence against me doing anything dangerous when i went to syria i was just a housewife the entire four years stayed at home took care of my husband took care of my kids i never did anything dangerous i never made propaganda i never encouraged people to come to syria so did you know what islamic state were doing when you left for syria <laughs> Because they had beheaded people, there were executions. Yeah, I knew about those things, and I was, I was okay with it at first because, you know, I want, I, st I started becoming religious, religious just before I left. And, you know, from what I heard, that Islamically, that is all allowed, so I was okay with it. Again, is there anything that you would like to tell them? Just please don't give up on trying to get me back i really don't want to stay here that's it must have been a terrible shock for them when you left because at first obviously they, they did try and help they did try and ask me to come back but i kept saying no to them and then afterwards they gave up and now i'm kind of after four years i'm asking them for help now it's kind of a big slap in the face to them but i really need their help so interesting position to be in right because on the face of it you're gonna you can just say you know she can get fucked right because you know we've watched enough movies we've watched enough of homeland to know that this could easily be a double agent right this could easily be a, a bluff she could easily come in 
um, say that she's, you know, she, please forgive me. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And then suddenly she turns around and she blows up the fucking Tower Bridge, right? It could easily happen, right? People could easily, I understand why people have that idea because, you know, we've seen enough movies, we've seen enough um, instances or we've heard enough instances where this has happened. But also, there might be another side of it where she was just literally a, an innocent 15 year old who was caught up in ideology, um, caught up with being overly religious, right? And went across um, to Syria in order to kind of, you know, um, seek enlightenment or whatever it may be to, you know, uh, band together with her fellow brothers and sisters. And she thought that she was fighting a good fight. There could be something, you know, very kind of weirdly honorable about that, right? But there is a part of me that also wants to say that maybe we need to get back to the point of even we, even I, I'm a, not a big fan of council culture and I think that sometimes it's going to be OTT and people are getting ostracized and not being and not being given a route back to redemption or getting route back inside society. I think there also needs to be an emphasis on the consequences of your actions, right? I think sometimes in life or in general, it seems that the consequences to your actions really depend on where you stand politically, right? You saw what happened with that Covington kid, the kid in America who wore that Make America Great hat again and in front of the Native American dude bang, banging the drum. Um, when it transpired that effectively, whatever the story that was being spun in the media, that supposedly this guy was shouting, expletive as this Native American guy that, you know, whatever it may be, whatever the story that they spun, it wasn't necessarily true, but it seems that like that story just fizzled out, right? Because the kid effectively is a conservative and that's not really in vogue at the moment. And um, Native American represents everything the conservatives kind of hate and everything the liberals kind of hate about conservatism. And that story basically disappeared. So the consequences of your actions, the consequences of being a celebrity and openly calling for people to punch a little 16-year-old boy because you don't like the hat he's wearing on his head aren't as severe as it is on the other side, right? On the other side, if someone else did that to a, a person from the left, you know, they'd be cancelled forever. So the consequences kind of really depend on your level of, you know, the level of celebrity you have, how much money you, like for instance, like, you know, Harvey Weinstein might not see the inside of a prison cell because of the amount of money and resources he has, right? You probably won't see that. But if you're some, if you're like the general dude on the street and you end up doing what, you probably won't do what he did. You won't probably get away with it. But if you did what he did, you probably won't have the resources to to kind of fight it in court. And he still probably, he probably hasn't still even, even been in, in a jail, has he, this whole time? I don't know. But the consequences really depend on, you know, your level of resources, whatever I'm saying, right? But I think in general, there needs to be an acceptance of the consequences of your actions for the wider public. People to see that, you know, you can't just go and, you know, um, you can't just go and marry into an ISIS tribe, right? An ISIS settlement in Syria and then suddenly decide, oh, this is a bit too much. This is, getting a, this is a bit too real. And then decide to come back and integrate yourself back into society. Because how, what, how can we even, how can you even judge if she is... Um, if she can be reintegrated back into society, right? I didn't really get, I didn't, again, she's 19. She's really tired. She just gave birth. So this interview isn't really the best place to really judge her character. And she's in a fucking refugee camp, which I'm sure is super stressful, but she didn't come across the best on that video, right? She didn't cross, she didn't come across remorseful. She came across quite entitled, right? The fact that she's a British citizen, she thought, yeah, I could just come back. And I? I made a mistake. Let me just come back home. Um, I'm just a wife, right? It doesn't really seem like she understands the gravity of the, crime that she's committed and that's maybe the worrying part of it right there's this and and again if you're a person that's left-leaning if you're you're probably going to be like hey everyone deserves forgiveness everyone should be welcomed back in but is it though should you really be welcoming a, a former isis bride into society especially now what's going on with brexit and you know populism and nationalism sweeping the nation this probably isn't the safest place for her to come back to anyway in general maybe it's more it's you know maybe it could be argued about the level of safety and overall sentiment in the country, but I don't know if this is the right time. And it really, again, it just, I'm just split. I don't really know what decision it is they're going to make. And this is, I guess this is why, you know, politicians are paid the big bucks, have the influence or power or, um, they, or influence that they have in general. This is where they're really going to earn their money because what do you do with this Shamima Begum girl? What do you do? She's 19. She might have generally made a mistake and she might have generally not known what she was getting herself into or she might have just got there and realised that this is just too real and decided to come back. But whatever it may be, there is also a child involved, right? And a child that has nothing to do with any of this, what's going on, what happens to that kid. Um, yeah, it's a difficult position to be in and I don't admire anyone who's on the decision-making panel to kind of sort this out. Um Again, so let's see what happens. And off the back of that, um, another thing that kind of ties in with society and what's going on and what the fuck is happening with that nation, seven Labour MPs have quit, right? 
Um, and they've you know cited the fact that you know modern day politics at the moment doesn't represent the people. The parties don't represent what the people's interests are, and obviously on the back of what's happening with Brexit, you know, it's been a complete fucking catastrophe. Um, yeah, we're we're in an interesting position, right? We're in a very very interesting position where I think the general public has kind of woken up and realized that these politicians that we held to such high regard just you know don't you know only know as much know as much as we do about how to fix this nation about how to you know mend the divisions that are, that are kind of sweeping the nations over and kind of bring us back under this this flag and what 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 the european union means to us and to those that live outside of the major cities there is a real challenge um, ahead and it seems like no one has the answer, which is, I think, a little bit... I, I'm, I'm a little bit more... Even though, you know, the UKIP guys are wiling and doing whatever they're doing, I'm, a, I'm, I'm happy that they're all around and they all have a voice and they're all saying something. And it seems like no one's really sure on what the decision is. You know, you can even see it with reflected in the how close the Brexit vote was. It was the, 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 the nation was split 50-50 as to what was the right way to go. And I think now in the kind of months to come we're hopefully going to see more answers and questions from the politicians that we kind of like put into power in order to make these harsh decisions and maybe we're going to see a different kind of governance um that again is going to be more beneficial to the general public because you know i think we've kind of been forgotten about for the most part right um we've kind of been used as quote-unquote political pawns to kind of advance people's individual careers as opposed to the benefit of the nation of rural. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping off the back of these MPs quitting that it's not just some big publicity stunt that we're going to see some major change coming forward. Um, going from that, um, Jussie Smollett lied, it seems like. And this story is something that really kind of puzzled me and um, really intrigued me and just, I don't know, it's just it just keeps getting crazier and crazier and crazier. So this Jesse Smollett guy who, if you don't know, is an actor from Empire. I don't watch Empire because, you know, I'm not an idiot. Um, he supposedly um, suffered an... Uh, he was suffered a hate crime because he was gay in Chicago. That's what he kind of deduced it as and the, the whole story goes that he popped out to go get a sandwich. He gets attacked by these two MAGA, we MAGA hat wearing guys who shout um, racial expletives, um, um, whatever it may be to him, say MAGA country, tie a noose around his neck and dip out, right? And then this tied in with the letter that was sent into Fox News that were threatening him, just like, just, you know, crazy shit that happened. So it seemed really a sad and really bad thing. And I think the story also came out that he's supposed to be someone cracked his ribs and, you know, he was in pain and blah, 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 blah. And everyone had sympathy for him. And then, but then when the story came out, immediately it kind of seemed a bit fishy to me generally because it just didn't, you know, it just seemed like something that would come out of a movie, something like I have a bad script. And I think I heard someone mention it um, in another podcast that Jesse Smollett's um, alleged attack sounded like, it sounded it sounded exactly like what an actor would write when they're trying to write their own script, right? It just sounded ridiculous. So I, I wasn't really sold on it in general, but again, you're not going to be the one to kind of come out and say, hey, this guy's lying. I know some people were really brave in terms of the Joe Buttons, so it's kind of stuff he kind of called bullshit on it immediately, but I wasn't that um, brave enough to say it out loud because I just, again, you just, you just don't want to believe that people would lie about things like this. It happened... It, same thing that happened during the whole um, Harvey Weinstein thing, right? Wasn't there a lady that accused Harvey Weinstein of sexual assault and it just transpired that it wasn't actually true? She lied completely just to get herself, um, you know, um, some spotlight to get some, some attention. There's the other lady that was a friend of Rose McGowan who also uh, was accused, was kind of accusing people of sexual assaulting her and it transpired that she had sexual assault with another dude. Like, it's just, you know, there's this whole vict the victimhood has been put on the pedestal. So, you know, it's no surprise that some people are going to want to be victims in order to kind of further over their message or to kind of get in on the action and he didn't want to think that about Jesse Smollett right because I watched one interview of his on the breakfast club and he came across really cool really funny um, really intelligent but again he's maybe too ideologically possessed right he's he's really on that he's really riding that Trump is a racist train and really kind of you know fighting the whole Black Lives Matter fight and just you know doing everything apart from just being a great actor which can you always kind of look a bit strangely at, right? In general, because of again, if I was a fan of Empire, I wouldn't really give a fuck about his political leanings because I just want to watch him be a great actor on TV. I don't care what he thinks about the presidency. Um, the people that I want to care about it, I look at those, and I, I don't know. I just I always feel a bit weird. It's always a bit. I always my, my, the warning lights go off for me when real, really high profile public figures are overly political. Um, they're usually trying to you know steer the conversation one way they're usually trying to 
it seems a bit self-serving for me, in, just in my opinion, right? I don't necessarily care what any actor has to say about anything that's happening in society. That's not what that's that's not where I see their place in society. Their place in society for me is to inspire, to take people out, you know, to kind of like make you tap out of what's happening on the outside world and escape into this world and see them act and see them, you know, just just again escapism. I don't want to hear them kind of, you know. Um, talking about how shitty the world is from their privileged uh, pulpit. Just my opinion. But anyway, the story goes on and transpires. It kind of rumbles on. They investigate the story. And now it kind of transpires that supposedly, 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 just as Smollett actually orchestrated this whole attack himself in an effort to kind of make sure his character wasn't killed off on Empire. That's the story. That supposedly he heard or caught wind that they were going to phase him out of the show or something along those kind of lines. So to gain sympathy... And to make sure that, you know, he kind of played the sympathy card and tugged at the heartstrings, he concocted this um, whole um, attack so that he could remain on a show. And it just really baffles me because, number one, it's such a shitty attempt at it because, you know, effectively, you know, you see a lot of videos sometimes of people doing weird shit they thought they could get away with. But this is just insane. Like, what, how did he honestly think that he could get away with making this story up and people not investigate it? And especially... um in Chicago, right, that's, you know, they, there's already an, a magnifying glass put on Chicago with the amount of gun crime or the amount of violence, the amount of people get killed there, gang violence is on the up, um, the Chicago Police Department is always under the microscope too for being corrupt and all that sort of malarkey, so if ever there was a case that they had to get right, it would be this case, so it seems like, look, from reading this blog, this um uh CBW blog, which kind of like talks about stuff on the, on the ground in Chicago, they were calling bullshit on it from a while back ago, saying that sources were telling them in the police department that they weren't sure about it because Justice Smollett was really being hesitant, hesitant to give them the phone records. And, you know, people were like, you know what? If he doesn't want to give the hand over his phone, I understand that because he is a celebrity. He might be a dealer celebrity, but he's a celebrity nonetheless. There might be some incriminating things in there that might put other celebrities in trouble. But what happened, What what the, the thing that's funny about it is that he gave them the phone records after a while, right? But he gave them redacted phone records and what happened is that I think the police already had his phone records anyway, but they asked him to give his to give you know to give his copy of it, and he took off some numbers or redacted some issues on it, and whatever was missing was the pieces that they needed to put together. So the police were able to put together the case because he omitted some numbers or some details from his phone records, and they were able to marry up with the records that they had, and immediately they caught him, and then they brought in these. The two alleged attackers on the video were uh, supposedly two extras that work on Empire, these two massively built um, Nigerian dudes who kind of um, are an empire. They flew back to Nigeria after the filming. When they landed back into the USA, they were immediately picked up, interrogated, and it seems like they immediately flipped on him. And now we have this interesting case where I just, I'm interested to see what happens next, which is his smell. Like, what happens? Like, does, what's the punishment for lying? allegedly what is the punishment um because this is a really really serious issue like effectively he was trying to play up being a victim in order to kind of not get himself chucked off tv not even just in terms of a public conversation right and again it's just it's just weird right he's already a, he's he's like if there was a medal for the oppressive olympics right oppression olympics he'd be he'd be up there he might be have a bronze medal right he's an african-american dude who's also gay um, there's also, there's always going to be pressures, you know, of him in the industry and society base, like, and he still needed to concoct another one on top of it and play into the whole, um, they're living in a racist country kind of thing motif and everyone that supports Donald Trump is a racist and Donald Trump is a racist thing. It's just, it's just crazy, man. And if anything, it goes to show, I think more, more of these issues, more of these kind of situations, more of these, more of this kind of rhetoric, more of these fucking false hoax cases, if anything, this puts this kind of reaffirms my idea or my impression that 100% Trump will get reelected on 2020. Number one, it doesn't seem like there's any kind of candidates out there at the moment who are really going to challenge him. But it seems like more, as more of these issues come about, the people that did vote for him are going to be even more encouraged to vote for him. The people that were on the fence are going to see the left's influence and you know this victimhood, this kind of like victim olympics this oppression stuff this power dominance hierarchy thing that they're always obsessed with on the left it's going to reaffirm their desire to kind of get that shit out of politics because you know no one wants that who wants someone to come into politics who kind of sees everybody as their collective group and not as an, a, a sovereign individual that's not how we want gov to be governed um effectively and um yeah i'm just i'm just sad for everyone involved i'm sad for him i think it's incredibly embarrassing 
Um, I don't think it's going to impact his career as much as people think it will do. I think we had to see the Covington case thing with a kid with a Native American guy was a good impression of it. I don't think people are going to care as much as people think as if they think they're going to care. I think in general, because he's a left-leaning guy, people are going to sweep under the rug. But I think for him in general, it's super embarrassing. Like, you know, he came out on stage with cue cards talking about how he got beaten up. And now it transpired that supposedly he made the whole thing up himself. And yeah, um, he's supposedly hired a really high-class lawyer to kind of defend himself uh, from any kind of accusations of this. But it looks like that is the case of the issue. And again, um, I don't know. Like, if that's what living is, right, to become a, a victim or something, then I guess I'm not living right because I do not, not want to be that dude. Well, you have to kind of justify existence through um, these kind of weird tactics. But hey, ho what do i know uh, what's next on here uh, uh, uh. oh this is an interesting one piece um amazon pulls out of the new york hq so amazon was meant to launch hq hq2 they had the big it was really strange in general because they had this massive kind of american idol um competition where they went all across where they um you know where they op it was like an open invitation open kind of you know competition where these different states across the U across the US were petitioning for Amazon to build their new headquarters in their state. The whole idea behind it was that when Amazon come along, they provide loads of jobs, infrastructure rises, they invest lots of money in the state, blah, 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 right? So everyone kind of wanted to have that injection of cash into their state. And everyone positioning for it. And it seemed like it would be a great opportunity for a startup or for one of these companies to really tap into middle America, right? Because much like the UK, where a lot of people say that the Brexit issue happened because, you know, for the most part, politics only really centered around talking to people that were in London, Manchester, Liverpool, and more the major cities and not people that actually lived within kind of, you know, the rest of the UK outside of those big cities. The same issue happens in the US, right? Where most of these manufacturing jobs that were taken away through automation or through just, you know, advances in modern technology, it'd be great if a startup could kind of recognize how much influence or how much they had to, or how much, um, they aided or how much they kind of the role they played in the kind of demise of those industries and try to kind of fix those issues by providing more jobs by reinvesting back into those kind of states by kind of opening up an office in those kind of places and providing some jobs right of course some of these jobs won't initially go to local residents anyway because they're going to be software based jobs but it will be an opportunity for some people to come and work and to kind of gain um, gainful employment and also just the fact that there's going to be uh, people working in these big offices it, it's an opportunity for businesses to spring up all around that area whether they be cafes or restaurants or that malarkey so it, was, it seemed like a good idea right but there was a lot of resistance i saw in general online too about it because it seemed like you know it seemed like a weird convoluted way for amazon to collect loads of data on these states um that would all that would ultimately um uh, get fed back into the amazon machine and allow them to kind of make you know millions and billions and billions of dollars um by tapping into the needs of that particular state or within understanding what's actually going on through algorithms all that sort of malarkey but you know sometimes you know um you'd rather you know it's kind of maybe a price willing you're willing to pay in order to kind of provide jobs for your constituents whatever it transpires and in the end what amazon do they end up picking fucking new york to, to put the headquarters everyone's kind of bummed out but you know again uh, the people in the area of new york where they wanted to put the headquarters at were really happy about it and it seemed like again a great idea and then but then you know with the rise of politicians such as like alexandria ocasio cortez democratic socialists they were very vehemently against it because amazon gets amazing tax breaks um, and the incentive for you know the state to give them a tax break is that the tax break would then invite would then give them more opportunity to come in and provide more jobs blah blah blah. they might there's like a golden handshake involved in those kind of things but you know if you're a socialist you don't want them to get tax breaks you think they should they should pay uh, whatever else pays and of course amazon didn't want all that trouble didn't want that stress didn't want didn't want to pay the money so they decided to pull out and that was a big kind of conversation happening right around like what um what has happened what transpired whether or not as in the cortez uh, cut off her nose to spite her face and kind of maybe fucked over um, residents of New York in general in the long run because now, you know, it's going to dissuade other startups from kind of coming in and setting up shop. But Kara Swisher from Recode had a really good interview on the New York Times that I'm going to kind of try and read out here that really spoke about it really well. And um, it's a quote um, on New York Times. I've, I've, maybe I might have um, gone over my allowance for free articles on here i'm always reading articles on the new york times let's see what happens blah, 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 blah. load it up load it up so car switcher from recode i'm a big fan of her she's got amazing podcasts she interviews loads of influential startup guys and gals but yeah i've run over my allowance but anyway um this is the article on the screen it's called amazon is interested in making the world a better place 
Um, and the quote that I kind of pulled off from here that I'm going to read out to you guys is as follows. Um, Kaisal says something that really kind of resonated with me. And it says here, um, at many New Yorkers have cheered on the opposite, cheered on the opposition, assuming that it might persuade um, Amazon to strike a better deal with the city. They mostly agree that more tech jobs would be good for New York, good salaries and more money for retailers, restaurants and the real estate industry. More than more than bad gentrification and congestion. But no one wanted to end up like San Francisco, uh, which has become a modern hellscape, even as Internet companies build their airy HQs and become even richer. Their, their tax giveaways only exasperate income inequality and offered no solutions, which is very true, right? Um, San Francisco is the home of loads of tech startups and love and the actual, you know, the overall tech uh, um, the startup ecosystem kind of lives in San Francisco, but it's also got one of the highest rates of homelessness of when you kind of, you know, stay in the US. Um, Amazon certainly could have been more creative in proposing some um, bombs for those ills in New York. For example, it could have entered into the core public-private partnership to fix the junkie subways. Its employees would have ridden and perhaps the new innovations. You know, making the world a better place. No, I guess not. Which is really true because I think with the... the, with the um, with the documentary on if it is it Terramos, which has just come out recently with a documentary about fire festival with the stuff that i've gone through with people.io and nicholas oliver being a fucking fraud and a scam artist i think people are getting to see more and more over the last few years with the stuff that's happening with facebook i think the misses the kind of um the allure the kind of like starry-eyed look people had with startup founders is slowly starting to ebb away we're starting to see that effectively they are like you know startup founders are and i kind of have more had more sim have more have more in similar with like the standard big corporate bosses that make gazillions of the stock market as they do with you know um yeah they, they're more similar with them as opposed to like the general public right because the, the promise of these startups was that they're going to make the world a better place right um famously uh google's um i think motive or mo was like don't be evil but over time with the rise in influence the rise in power the more money the more um um inf uh, kind of influences that were kind of driving their decision making processes those things kind of like fell by the wayside and people got to see that these guys just want out there to make money the bottom line is that they have to justify their existence by making money. They have to justify their, you know, the amount of money they've invested. They've got people that are counting on them. So there's other plays at work that are kind of really dictating these actions that they do. But ultimately, they don't really have your best interest in mind. You know, the general public or, you know, even employees that work there, right? I think the idea that you could go into a startup and you can make your own way, you can make a change, grab a project by the scrap of the neck and kind of like drive a project forward is great. But on the flip side, you are in a you're involved in an industry in a business that is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly um, um, reactive, right? It, it's, it's very knee jerk. Um, it's very dependent on investment. Some of these businesses or some of these companies are not very are not generating any money, right? They just spend loads of money. Um, Snapchat being a good example, right? They burn through loads of amounts, cash after cash after cash, and just rely on advertisers coming in and pumping money in to kind of offset the fact that they don't actually make any any actually any any money right they try to do the snap spectacles but that they really uh kick off so people are seeing that their business don't really work that well they come into you know um they come into states and try or boroughs or uh, locations of cities um they lobby for tax exemptions in order to kind of circumvent and navigate some stuff in order to come in and get gain some favors and set up shop and then they don't reinvest into the local community, which is maybe difficult to do because most of the jobs that they are um, advertising for call for a certain level of acumen, a certain level of intelligence. And some people just might not have it or ability or able to learn, whatever it may be. But it does seem like the allure of a startup coming into your city and setting up shop has completely evaporated. And no one sees them as like these, you know, geniuses anymore. Even maybe, maybe it goes back as far as back as Steve Jobs. When that old biography came out, people saw how shitty of a guy he was. It, the kind of a lot of Steve Jobs kind of dim, kind of dim somewhat. Obviously, to the most of the Steve Jobs loyalists out there, they won't give a fuck. But people got to see like, oh, this guy was actually a bit of a bad dude, right? Even though he made this amazing phone and created this amazing iPad and this laptop and this iPod, like he was a bad guy to his employees, and that was something that was a bit like you know, it took people um, back a little bit. And we've seen it happen again and again. And of course, with the whole um, Fire Festival thing with the Billy McFarlane stuff, we saw that. So I think in general, this Amazon HQ is maybe a watershed moment in that I think more startups are going to have to be socially aware more and not just like, you know, um, have it as just one of their selling points. It's going to have to be something that they actually do. They actually try to make the world a better place. And I think the way to make the world a better place is to start locally, right? I think they have, their ambitions are a little bit too far-fetched. 
Um, and I think they maybe over egg their um, influence. They over egg their importance. For the most part, most startups don't really matter, right? If they disappear tomorrow, no one would fucking care. But I think what they can do is start by kind of addressing the issues around their local community and taking an active role in making their community a better place. You know, like I've worked in community managing jobs for the most part, and they generally just are limited to the people that use your app or your service online or via the app. But it would be great if community management actually met actually meant going out there and talking to the community in and around your place of work and where you actually are situated at and having that personal connection with the people in and around there and seeing what you can provide for them, what you can do for them. Again, it's a very, um, it's a very, um, it's a very, uh, it's maybe it's a little bit far-fetched to say that and I guess it probably doesn't serve their bottom, uh, their bottom line. But I think that active participation, like real participation, is something that's really needed. And I think if they want to gain favor with the public, if they want to gain tax exemptions, I think people don't really care if they do get tax exempt. But I think if they're not, if they get tax exemptions and they're not really giving back to the community, then I'm not really shocked that um, uh, New York residents decide to like give Amazon the boot or to pressure them until they left. Again, maybe in in the long run, they might really feel the consequence of this, and it might have ram- it might have some unintended consequences that we don't really see now. But I think in general, it is maybe a bit of a sea change and a bit of a cultural shift. And maybe startups will have to look in the mirror and see that they have to do a bit more for their um, community that they're trying to tap into. Again, it's a very, um, it's a very, um, it's something I'm hoping that happens. That probably won't happen because most of these guys don't give a fuck. But um, it'd be great if someone did give a fuck in general. But hey, we can only hope, we can only wish. Um, what else is next on the list here? contemporary rude boy blondie mccoy oh okay so blondie mccoy had a great great interview with sense again i've, I've said it a couple times on here and i've put i think um i've not I'm, i've never really been sold in a whole blondie mccoy thing just because you know um i've i'm from london i come from here i've been around the scene for a while um i know what this this kind of person has existed for a while right again you know he's kind of been able to kind of really tap into his kind of online fame and take it to you know, really great heights and he's done really well for himself. But I've seen this kind of person exist on the scene for a while and they've always kind of rubbed me up the wrong way anyway in general. And just the idea of kind of, um, let's say, glorifying the best bits of working class culture whilst, you know, um, you know, hiding behind your privilege or kind of upper class um, upbringing, which again, it's not your fault. It's not his fault, in it, that he comes from um, good standing or middle class background. But it's just this kind of fakey, you know, tracksuit wearing with loafers, kind of like, you know, um, forced chav thing that really rubbed me up the wrong way. I don't know why. I don't know why. It really shouldn't. But I think by and large, anyway, I think in general, I think in society, I think what we have to do is that if there's something about someone, if there's something about somebody that you don't like, right, let's let's put it that way. If there's something about someone you don't like, I think you have to kind of really weigh up with the amount of good that they're doing. And I think for the most part, Blondie McCoy is doing more good than he is doing bad, right? He's this middle class posh kid who purposely wants to look one way, sound one way, right? Because he probably doesn't want to be associated with his posh background because, you know, maybe doesn't really identify with it. Um, he's he's a mixed background kid as well, like heritage wise, like he's, I think he's Middle Eastern or whatever it may be. Um, and he's also, you know, come up on social media um he blew up on social media not even that malarkey gained all that social fame and clout went through that um drug um alcohol abuse and now he's completely sober he's kind of like um fixed his life up he's doing loads of art he's got a great brand underneath his belt you know he's infiltrating the fashion scene he's a probably a really good influence the kids coming up and he's only what 21 or something those kind of lines so even though there's stuff about him that really rubs it up the wrong way and i kind of think he's probably doing a lot of bad and that kind of you know um not exasperating the issue but you know it, it, there's something about it that seems a bit inauthentic i still think in general for the kids coming up it's great for them to have a uh a kind of someone to look up to that is that is like them right that's kind of gone through the whole alcohol and drug abuse thing in the scene decide that wasn't a good way to kind of be um productive in his work and whatever maybe and decided to take the really extreme route of becoming sober because someone like him in a position to become sober at that age especially with the friends that he has must be really difficult i know how difficult it, it was for me when i kind of decided to kind of uh lay off the drinking and all that sort of lucky for an extended period of time um, i must i can only imagine what it must be for a cool kid on the scene to decide they want to be sober because most of the things that he does involves drinking right most of the most of the social engagements the meetings um the store launches the gallery events 
events, they all involve alcohol to some level. Um, so to kind of completely avoid that, which kind of, again, lends itself to how you build relationships in that world is a big deal. And it's kind of probably, it's probably hurting him in, in the short run. But in the long term, it's allowing him to be very productive. He's doing loads of artwork. He's been able to get himself about. And I just think in general, it's probably a great message for the kids coming up to see somebody of that ilk take such a, you know, an extreme stance. And I think um, uh, he had a quote here. Um, oh, and I think the, 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 the sensitive view, the good thing about it, I think as well, a good lesson for the kids coming up is that supposedly, I didn't know this, but he's kind of been pushed out of Thames, it sounds like, right? So he's kind of talks about Thames, a brand that he has. And I think he mentions that. Um, da, 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 what he says here? Uh, that he's not doing any more. What he says? Yeah. So, so what will happen with Thames? He said basically, I was business partners with Thames, and I kind of operated on a system that wasn't my own. In recent years, I found that I, I can apply certain quality control to everything else, like my art, but not my clothes. Thames was good enough, but not excellent. So, of course, he wasn't really happy with the quality he was uh, you know, putting out there with Thames. And I guess maybe Thames might have been something that some of the, I don't know, maybe it's one of the Slam City, Slam City guys went in to kind of front it as a kind of brand, whatever it may be, which was quite cool. He's able to kind of make some money off it. But in in the long run, you can tell, again, he, he gives a shit. He cares about the kids because, you know, he, di he, did, he didn't like the quality of work he was putting out there. And he went to make something a little better. And now the stuff that he's doing with his own namesake brand, I think it's called Blondie, right? I'm pretty sure he sells it on his own website. He wants to do that. And again, I think kids have to be very wary about these punches that happen, right? Because I think for the most part, a lot of kids out there that have influence that are very um, popular on social, they probably might get presented a lot of these projects that seem good on the face of it because you make money from just, you know, picking colorways of fucking polo tops and shit like that and making sure logos are the right way around. But in the long run, I think sometimes you have to be very sensitive of um, what you attach your name to, right? And I think sometimes the short monetary gain of, you know, collecting money from selling old lower print hoodies that you don't really care about is great. But I think long term wise, if it's fucking naff, I think the kids that actually care about you, like your 1000 true fans, they're going to they're going to read into it and they're going to they're going to be able to sniff out the, inauf the inauthenticity of it. And then you'll never be able to get those guys back again. So I think you have to be very, very cognitive and very aware that. You have to be very selective of where you put your name and how you attach it. And I think the good thing with Thames and Blondie is that it wasn't his name, right? He was able to kind of hide behind Thames and, you know, he kind of didn't really... I didn't really see him in the shoots for the brand for the most part, maybe in the beginning, but they used other kids to kind of model the, model the clothing, which was a good thing as well. So there's no like historical record of him wearing loads of the pieces out there. There might be some, I'm sure, but for the most part, you know, I, I, I mainly saw some like, you know, random models wearing it, which is good. And you'll be able to distance off of it and kind of relaunch blonde, um, Blondie. So I think in general, it's probably doing more good than bad. Um, the fact that it rubs me up the wrong way probably is what neither here or there because I don't really think I'm his target market anyway because I'm much older than he is. But again, I just think it's a good, it's a good, he's a good role model for kids coming up because again, he is somebody that's of the culture, is in the scene, very much steeped into it, is a celebrity in the scene. Like kids follow him all over the place when he has those um, things that he does where he sells his old clothes you know kids queue up all around the corner to kind of buy his stuff and he gives his money away to charity like really cool and honorable things that he doesn't really have to do but i think for the for the short run it's good to see kids out there or um influence or leaders out there um that are sober and kind of promoting that kind of way of life for the kids coming up in general um i think that's fucking cool let's move on uh What's this? Um, next, men's makeup, right? It's, it's this little article that I saw on Hypebeast that I thought was interesting about the uh, rise in men's makeup or, you know, something along those kind of lines, which, again, I'm just not very much sold on at all. Um, I just think it's going to it's gonna take a big, big cultural shift to get guys to, to you know, to want to put makeup on their face outside of, you know, because, again, I think I've, I thought of it myself because nowadays when I, whenever I kind of do my self-care or my kind of daily, you know, um, skincare regime, it mostly just involves putting moisturizer on, right? But in the last few months, I've started to get um, these um, oils that I've kind of mixed with my cocoa butter or whatever it may be. And that kind of allows me to kind of get a bit more of a sheen on my face, right? So it's these kind of really nice oils that you can put some of them in my fragrance. And effectively, I put them into a small pot, mix it around and kind of add, add that and kind of apply it to my face. Just to kind of give myself a bit of a glow. And that you can maybe say that's makeup, but it's, I'm not necessarily putting on foundation. I'm not applying any brushes, and you just want to look clean. I think that's my idea. I think of like um, 
skincare regime. I want to look clean. I want to look visibly clean because you know it's very hard to look that way for a guy outside of a haircut, outside of really shiny clothes, outside to look day day to day. So it's, it's hard to look clean with a girl. You know the makeup, the hair. There's loads of layers that can really make you look fresh. Um, so that's one side of it. But I think fundamentally, guys don't have the. We just I don't I just I'm talking from a heterosexual male point of view. I just don't think we have the the desire to look pretty or to look good i don't think so i think for the most part uh, a heterosexual male's desire to look attractive or to look very well put together is to attract the opposite sex or somebody else that they want to get into a romantic or sexual uh, relationship with that's what the most reason was right like i know for me when i started to lose weight or when i started to kind of wear nice clothes i just went to fuck that was it right i wanted to improve the level of women i was able to attract by working out and by wearing nicer clothes or by trying to appeal to a broader range of women right That's essentially what you want to do um but it, it would need to i think men to make up for it to kind of really permeate and to kind of gain footing there would need to be a shift in that in the in way in the way that how men uh put themselves together and and the intentions right because it's very unlikely no you don't really see many guys that just go out and get dressed up really to you know dress up to the nine just to kind of hang out it does not really exist outside of fashion dudes right outside of guys that care about brands and care about logos and care about labels and care about houses and care about history uh, culture and all that sort of malarkey outside of those guys you won't really go into weatherspoons and see like a random dude just like dressed to the nines in like a several suit who isn't on the pool right for the most part guys that dress really well are on the pool they want to attract a mate or they want to attract uh somebody that they want to be romantically involved in so I think that would have to change. Guys would have to want to go out and just look cute for themselves, right? Which sounds fucking weird. And then, then the makeup thing might um, come into it. But then again, there's also a little... There's also something... There's also like something about... I, I don't know why, but guys have something against other guys who take too much care with themselves, right? David Beckham being a good example of it, right? So most guys... Some guys hate David Beckham because he really took pride in his appearance. And there is something about... I don't know what it is about dudes that really get annoyed with someone that cares about the appearance. Maybe because it's a vanity thing. Maybe it goes back to like, you know, um, Hunter Gatherer era where maybe that guy was the one that was snitching. That guy was the one that was kind of trying to get out of going on a hunt. I don't know what it is, but it's something about a guy that takes care of themselves that really rubs some dudes up the wrong way. So until those things change, I don't think we're going to see men's makeup really permeate within like... Um, uh, within the general public or within men in general, I think out. You know, I I think even the kind of Georgie Shaw guy would kind of be hard pressed to kind of be taken seriously with a full face of makeup in amongst his friends. I don't think that would work because those guys really care a lot about their appearance, right? They go underneath sun bears, they get waxes, they work out insane amounts, like they wear really tight clothes, show off their muscles. But I think even those guys would be hard pressed to kind of go day by day wearing foundation or eyeliner and all that sort of malarkey. Again, um, I would like to see it because I think there is something to be said for that kind of freshness look, right? That kind of wanting to look clean. But I just don't know whether or not guys want to look pretty. That's the thing that I'm kind of on the fence about. Again, um, I'm not sure who's going to do it. Someone might do it. We might see Rihanna kind of permeated. But I think, you know, even if ASAP Rocky brought out a makeup line, I don't think a lot of guys would want to buy into it. Or even someone like a Pharrell who's kind of well regarded or heralded for his skincare regime and looking really young. I think um, the only way it will kind of work again is from the kind of moisturizing, exfoliation kind of point of view. But I don't think the quote unquote brushing of the face will work for dudes overall. Just my opinion in general. I don't think necessarily guys will kind of really be up for that. Um, and, da, 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 da. and this kind of um, lends itself a little bit to this interview that I saw with. Uh, Say C.S. Marjan, I don't know how you pronounce his name, C.S. Marjan, uh, he's a Dutch um, New York based designer who's kind of really hotting up and he said something again that kind of lends itself to what I mean in terms of like guys don't want to look sexy, they just want to look comfortable and good, right? They just want to look comfortable for, for the most part and his brand is kind of like one of the brands you'd kind of, you know, say is a quintessential uh, comfortable brand out there. Uh, I'll try and get it up on here. Da, 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 da. So this guy called C.S. Major and he makes these amazing clothes, sort of like um, a better, I say better version of our legacy but like you know imagine how our legacy is right really comfortable boxy shapes and um i'll get some of it up on your screen so really comfortable shapes uh nice silhouettes um everything's very floaty and kind of you know 
looks really good on the body, like loads of nice silks and walls and stuff. And he said something really interesting in an interview with GQ that I'm going to read now, which kind of, again, lends itself to what I mean about guys probably don't want to look that sexy. And he says, um, uh, the, the interview asks him, uh, what do you mean by ease? And Cease Major says the following, um, all day long, you're in, a, you're in a pajama type of feeling, even though you're not actually in pajamas, like men, how they dress, right? I think that's something that men have really reacted to. Men are, all, uh, men are also really reacting to all the extreme pieces like the pink fur jackets or the super bright purple pants that he makes which sold out immediately and these are straight guys who are kind of trying to figure out who they are as men and because in the me too movement men are sort of confused straight men are sort of confused about who they are what they what, what they are and how they stand the solution maybe is wearing a pink fur jacket because that shows another side and i think that's really great right because you're you know as again i think as a heterosexual male myself that's something that's always been quite difficult right how do you because I've always, how do you kind of, um, you know, display your masculinity, right? But also the femininity side of you, right? The softness, right? Without it being a little bit too hard, too aggressive. Because, you know, we will have varying interests that kind of are, are, are at odds with the traditional masculine energy that exists. And for the most part, um, the only way to do it for a guy is by the clothes you wear, right? Um, intellectually or, you know, culturally it's hard because I'd have to talk to you to kind of find out that you're into theatre or do you like reading books or whatever, Maraki, but the, the one instant way to do it is by the clothes that you wear to kind of like, get, kind of um, soften um, the harshness of you or, or what you're about. And fashion does a really good job of doing that. So I think in general, um, for the most part, I think in a fashion world that's happening, right, you're seeing a lot more guys, you know, um, wearing uh, women's blouses and integrating them in their outfits, whether it's old Celine and stuff like that. Um, wearing pants that are a little bit more floaty looking, a little bit more airy. Pleated pants from Aisi Miyake being a good example, right? There's something inherently feminine about a pleated pant, but that's been taken into, uh, pulled into a men's wardrobe, um, showing off the ankles, more skin, blah, 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 blah. Um, going away from the overly really muscular look and going more to the kind of, you know, a svelte sort of like fit, um, Adam Levine kind of style looking. There is something to be said for it. But again, I just think we're far, far, far away, 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 away from men kind of having, you know, a, a makeup kit and then kind of, you know, powdering their face in between uh, meals when they're out. I just don't think that's something that's going to on the cards at the moment. But again, it might happen over time. Um, it might be a slow, slow burn. But I just think nowadays, for the most part, guys want to look comfortable. Guys want to look clean. Um, and you know, guys just want to have as many options, as many opportunities as possible to attract a mate through the, maybe the clothes that they're wearing. That's my POV on that one. Um, anyway, I think that might be a good place to end, you know, because we're on one hour 20 and, you know, I've got to head off. So this has been Axios English episode number 159. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. It's been a pleasure to have you here again um monday more motivation don't get too bummed out by the days um again we're in the last couple of weeks of february soon it'll be march and then festival season starts spring starts you know all the holidays come around and you're going to get to enjoy yourself there in there out for all information regarding me links to the website are down below for those watching on youtube like and subscribe share it with your friends let them know i'm about and i'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the Exynos english show peace out